Both of you have lived in China for nearly 10 years and have gone on many research trips. Where was China then? And what's the most significant change? I think a lot of things have changed in China over the, the 10 years that I've been here and many for the better. So for example, uh, you know, I, I'm a bird watcher. I like to go watching birds. And um, when I first started bird watching in Beijing, it would be very common for me to find people trapping birds uh, for the cage bird trade uh, pr predominantly. And the law enforcement authorities at that time were not interested. You know, you would call them, and, and it was almost as if you're calling me about birds. You know, I have so many more important things to do, um, and that was that was the general attitude. Uh, but now it's very different. So, uh, in my area of, of Beijing in Shunyi, I still occasionally find people trapping birds. It's still a problem, but the reaction of the law enforcement um, is much different. So. So now I have the local police on my WeChat and if I find a, someone, uh, someone trapping birds I can immediately send them the location and the picture and they will respond very quickly. Normally within an hour they will be there. Uh, yeah, and that is a huge change from, from 10 years ago. And of course, you know, at, at, at a, a bigger level in China I think we've seen some major positive changes. So we have this the concept of eco-civilization, you know, right from the top, from the president. And then underneath that, there's been many, many positive initiatives to help underpin that. So we've seen strengthening of environmental laws. We've seen uh, the creation of national parks. We've seen the ecological red line system. We've seen a complete turnaround in the Yellow Sea in terms of coastal wetland conservation. There are many uh, environmental NGOs springing up all over China. Um, set up by young people to protect particular species or ecosystems and so there's, there's been a sort of environmental awakening I describe it as over the last few years and I think that is really positive for the future. Also we can talk about air pollution you know when I first came 10 years ago it was a really serious problem in Beijing. It's still a problem but it's much much better. Uh, there's been a lot of emphasis on on improving air quality and also water quality. You know, the rivers in Beijing now are much cleaner. One issue that's still outstanding is soil pollution, um, which is also a serious issue in some places. Um, but so, so there's still work to be done, but there's been a lot of progress, I think, over the last 10 years. So, like Terry, I mean, I've been here to witness eco-civilization from when it first became a national priority, which I think was about the 2012, it's being put into the constitution and actually being implemented. It's not just something theoretical, but we have ecological red lines in my province. There is a much greater awareness and cognizance of biodiversity. There is also much more domestic tourism to see biodiversity. So every year we have more people with more expensive cameras coming to take photographs of biodiversity. You barely saw that when I first came to China. We're also seeing a depopularization of wild meat. So when I first came to China, it was very easy to see wild meat for sale. You don't really see that anymore because it's realized that that isn't something that's really acceptable anymore, particularly in young people. I think what we still do need to see is more emphasis on other elements that the West is now doing well now, like around development, for example. So when we build a new house, etc., when we're developing a house, at the moment there still aren't strong policies here in terms of doing a bat assessment or a bird assessment when you're doing that, and that is now mandated in the West. Yeah, I think just a, just a small example of the greater awareness on biodiversity. I think just this week, the day before I came here, um, I had a meeting with the Beijing government about um, renovations that are going to be planned on a lot of the old buildings in Beijing. And these old buildings are very important nesting sites for swifts. And uh, so they called a meeting to discuss how to manage those renovations in a way that would not negatively affect the swifts. So you know, the swifts are nesting there for three months of the year. So of course the, the, the 
ideal situation would be to do the renovations outside that time or if you have to do them during that time um, to consider ways to uh, enable the swifts still to access their nests. And I think this is a conversation that you know would not have happened five or ten years ago so I think you know, it's just a a small example but it shows that there's a general awareness. greater awareness yeah. and and consideration for biodiversity. So from those smaller examples to the bigger policies where do you see China heading? China's heading in a very good direction compared to when both of us came here some of these policies are unrecognizable and I mean the ecological red line policy is global leading policy. There are not many countries that have actually said, well, we're going to have this mode of managing land so that we can more equitably share land between biodiversity and humans. And they've done it nationwide. That's really impressive. China is really doing well domestically now in terms of domestic policy, but China's becoming a global leader. And part of being a global leader is being a steward elsewhere. China is also a major investor and a developer outside China. So uh, implementing those domestic policies on international development and expenditure is a next step to being a global leader, to showing, yeah, we have this policy, it's working well domestically, and if it can do that, then it will have a real global positive power in terms of biodiversity, conservation, and sustainable management.